what I'd love to do, if it's okay, is maybe we could just say yeah. a couple of words about yeah. how we come to this session, and that might help frame our discussion. Um, since I'm on the end, I'm okay to start. Um, as I mentioned, I serve as the executive director of uh, the Illinois Arts Alliance, which was established in 1982. Uh, and the Alliance uh, is a statewide coalition of arts organizations. Uh, and in 82, the organization was formed uh, at that time due to the threatened elimination of the Arts Council's budget. Um, today, we serve as one of the premier advocacy organizations in the country. Um, from me and my background, uh, I'm an, an artist myself, I'm a visual artist. Uh, I come from a family of artists. My father was a graphic designer. Uh, professionally, my background is in politics and public service. Uh, prior to joining the Alliance, I spent several years as a senior staffer uh, for uh, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Uh, and she serves as a representative for the 9th Congressional District, which was a district that was represented for 24 terms by a gentleman named Sidney Yates. You haven't heard of Sidney Yates and you care about the arts, he's someone you might want to look into. Um, he stood up to the threatened elimination of the NEA during the Reagan years and is really highly regarded uh, as one of the foremost champions of arts and culture in our country. Um, so the nice thing for me is I worked for a representative uh, in a district where being an advocate for the arts wasn't just encouraged, it was expected. Uh, so for me, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to marry uh, my lifelong love for the arts and my passion for uh, politics and social action and advocacy. Uh, and really that's what I hope we can talk about today is advocacy and why it's important and what it means to be an effective advocate. Um, I have my own story about the importance of advocacy, uh, but I'll share before I turn it over just a short story about uh, my former boss and, and mentor and how she came to advocacy because it's something that really is inspiring to me. Um, and for her, uh, Jan Schakowsky, she got involved, if she were sitting here, she said she got involved in advocacy and public service uh, in 1969. Uh, and in 1969, if you went to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread, uh, there was no way of knowing whether that gallon of milk would be good until the end of the week or whether that loaf of bread would go bad in the next two days. Um, Although consumers didn't know, the stock boys and, uh, knew based off of the barcodes. That's how they arranged good uh, on the shelf. So what she did is, remember this is in her own language, an ordinary housewife. Uh, she got together with three of her friends and in their uh, basement of their, their home, they came up with the name of the National Consumer Rights Advocacy Group. And really they cornered the stock boys and they forced them to translate the barcode. Uh, and then as consumers would enter the grocery store, they would hand out kind of the cheat sheet. Uh, and that effort in 1969 led to what we all know as fresh mistakes on products today. Uh, and if she were sitting here, she would say that that experience empowered her and changed her view uh, as an ordinary housewife to an ordinary housewife that can do extraordinary things. And while my personal journey in advocacy, uh, is that, that story may not be as compelling as Jan Schakowsky's, it's something I could totally relate with. Uh, the more you get involved in advocacy, the more you make your voices heard, uh, the more you transform yourself from someone who things happen to, uh, to someone who can make things happen. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping we can talk about today, is how to make things happen, uh, how to stand up and make your voices heard. Uh, you care about the art, you care about expression, uh, and I believe advocacy uh, is part of expressing yourself. That said, I'll turn it over to my family. Uh, I am very passionate about the arts, and I am of the belief that our culture really undermines the arts, uh, that there's way too much emphasis and glory put in places that really don't deserve it. I think that the most amazing, marvelous things on the planet were created by artists, and that um, to be in a culture in which that energy is put under it's just very painful for those of us who are artists. So organizations like the Illinois Arts Advocacy are very important. Um, I, you know, really I don't care about politics at all. It just, it, you know, I know that's a very probably shameful thing to admit, but where I did draw the line was when I began, somehow, probably because I'm a member of Chicago Artist Coalition, to get emails from an art advocacy, a 
national group um, that would alert you to knowing when bills are being passed in Congress regarding the arts and when um, um, national endowments for the arts, the money towards that is being cut. I recently sent a letter to uh, Senator Obama and um, Mm -hmm. Okay, I only care about Senator Obama. Um, but Legally, that's not the view expressed by the panel. <laughs> 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 we do not intend to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think we should be very dedicated to the earth. So it's important to me that I know that and I know where his stand is. Actually, that's what got me more interested in politics and I am now really following things very closely, but I came in through the arts advocacy uh, channel to that. Um, I also give a lot of my time to arts groups. Uh, I sit on the board of directors of a regional ballet company uh, here in the Chicago area, not too far from here, called the Salt Creek Ballet. And um, I'm, I'm here to learn as well and here to pass along the passion that we as artists really need to keep this dialogue going uh, so that things switch around a little bit in the country. Uh, There's just, you know, just not enough respect for what artists do. I'm also a member of a couple of local groups, Arts in Bartlett and um, Ontarioville Art, as well as Hoffman Estates Art League. Uh, And from that perspective, it's very important to be amongst other artists, as well as being a member of Chicago Artists Coalition. It's very important to network and be with other artists. A lot of times we work in isolation and um, you get ideas from people, not only artistic and creative ideas, but also how to to get your work out there and how to um, uh, get paid for what you love to do. Well, thanks for being a member. You're welcome. I, uh, my name is Olga Stefan, and as I mentioned, I am the director of the Chicago Artists Coalition, and we are a service organization here in Chicago um, that uh, provide professional development services to working artists, professional artists. So um, some of our activities include publishing the monthly newspaper that I've distributed to all of you. Um, we also uh, produce professional development workshops, and those are listed on the schedule of um, events that I've distributed. Um, our goal, of course, is to advance um, the careers of working artists throughout the state and in Chicago. Um, we currently have 2,300 members, and um, we provide those types of professional development services in, in many different ways, as well as online we offer um, opportunities on our website and uh, listings of grants, residences, calls for entry, those types of um, uh, pieces of information. We also partner up with a variety of different organizations throughout the city to make those types of alliances that you guys have expressed interest in. And there's just so many different types of alliances that um, are worthy of uh, discussing in this um, forum. Of course, um, because Ra is here and that we were prepared to discuss advocacy and that really advances all of our collective goals as an art community, that is a very important aspect of um, creating partnerships and alliances between groups, organizations, institutions, because the more we are as a collective, the stronger we are. And our voices, of course, in numbers can really make an impact. Um, And so our work, for example, with the Illinois Arts Alliance always um, is synchronized so that we can um, mobilize our members, 2,300 of them, we hope that most of them will respond to the various issues that affect our art community uh, statewide and in in the municipal area in Chicago, citywide. and collectively we can act um, as, as a group to try to change the policies that are in place that might act against our artists' rights and artists' interests. Um, but there are other alliances that are worthy of mention. Um, when collaborating with other organizations, um, we reach various people <coughs> that we might not have direct access to um, through our own personal um, and uh, kind of um, 
individual uh, tactics. So when we partner up with an organization in a different community, in a different neighborhood of the city, we reach a completely new world, a, a world, a community that might not actually access either our work as an individual artist or as an organization or um, understand what we do or just we have not engaged with before. So those alliances are really important and they mean a lot for the city of Chicago because only through those types of partnerships can we really um, create a cohesive art community. And uh, those are some things that I think would be worthy investigating as well. Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that we can spend a few minutes today talking about why advocacy is important. Uh, and, and number two, how to do it well. Uh, and, and for me, when I think about my core beliefs and why I enjoy my job so much is because it, it, it merges me and my core beliefs. From my own experience, uh, I, I believe that the arts have the power to transform individuals, families, and communities. Uh, one of the core beliefs of our organization uh, is that the instinct to create is universal. Uh, it lives within a kindergarten student in Oak Park, uh, just as it lives within a grandmother in East St. Louis. Uh, the third core belief uh, that I get to live out every day is the belief that democracy is a verb. It's not simply something we have, it's something we do. And the focus of the alliance is to uh, really carry the flag uh, and, and raise awareness that the contributions that artists make are just as important, if not more important, <coughs> than the contributions made by doctors, lawyers, policemen, and firemen. And that's a message that gets lost. Um, you know, I think, but I think that, that that's a message that's gaining momentum uh, you know, a friend of mine <coughs> told me their view about uh, the arts, and they compared the arts to the environmental movement. And 20 years ago, if you ran for national office, uh, you really didn't have to have a platform on the environment. Uh, now, you can't consider making a run uh, for national office without having a position on the environment. Uh, and the arts is really similar. Um, right now, today, if you Depending on your math, there are four candidates uh, remaining for president. Uh, no disrespect to Ron Paul. Um, three of those four have public statements on the arts. Probably the most progressive candidate on the arts uh, today is Mike Huckabee, um, former governor of Arkansas. Uh, if you listen to Hillary Clinton has a position statement on the arts. If you listen to uh, Barack Obama, his last two speeches, both in Virginia and Texas, <coughs> he talked about uh, wanting to make sure that we no longer teach <coughs> the text, uh, but we allow all young people an opportunity to learn about the arts, music, and literature. Um, why I think advocacy, arts advocacy is important. Uh, our charge is to uh, mobilize and engage a network of advocates to ensure that arts-friendly public policy are adopted at the federal, state, and local levels. Uh, at the federal level, there's a lot of good news and excitement these days. Uh, you know, I mentioned that the presidential campaign was mentioned before. Um, record number, record turnout in, in primaries that we're seeing is really um, an exciting atmosphere. It's kind of like American Idol on steroids, or American Idol meets Survivor. Uh, but it's exciting to see the level of interest uh, and in terms of arts policy, uh, this past year we saw a record increase for the NEA's budget, uh, $20.3 million over last year's funding level. Uh, but to give you some idea of the issues we care passionately about, uh, and then I, I want to talk about the crisis that exists in our state, because if you're not familiar with it, I think you need to be. Um, one of the issues that we, we care deeply about that's not non-budget related is an issue uh, like the Artist Museum Partnership Act, or also it's also referred to uh, as the Artist Fair Market Deduction Act. Are you guys familiar with this at all? Okay. Um, right now, today, the laws on our books. Let's say Olga uh, is a very talented painter. I don't know if she is, but let's say she is. Let's just say she. Let's is. say she. <laughs> and right now, today, Olga painted uh, an oil painting that was gorgeous and it was valued at $5,000. If Olga wanted to donate that painting to a library or to a community center or a nonprofit in, in, 
anywhere in the country, uh, she could do so, uh, but she could only write off the cost of her paint and her brush and her canvas. The true value of that painting cannot be reflected in, in what Olga would write off. Uh, however, if I am a collector or an art dealer or a gallery owner, I can donate Olga's painting to that community center, that, that museum, that local nonprofit, and write off a full $5,000 uh, tax write-off. Uh, that's simply not fair. Uh, and, and it's a piece of legislation that's been introduced for several years in Washington. Uh, this past year, Congressman John Lewis uh, was the sponsor. Uh, but again, they're, 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 that's one of dozens of examples of policy issues that impact artists and impact the arts community. Um, I want my panelists to weigh in on why it's important to be an advocate for the arts and, and hopefully we can talk a little bit about how to do it well and field some of your questions. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the crisis that exists today in, our, in this state, in Illinois, uh, in the arts community. Uh, all of the good things that's happening at the national level, uh, there, there's some very bad things happening here. Uh, and I'm familiar, I almost want to tell you to turn the tape off. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm familiar with the politics of Karl Rove and Tom DeLay. I, I'm familiar with the political gamesmanship that exists. Um, but nothing really prepared me for the level of acrimony that exists in this state between our state leaders. Uh, they all happen to be in the same party. Um, one of our, two of our key goals this past year um, was to advocate, number one, for Illinois Arts Council funding. Uh, the Illinois Arts Council is the state's granting agency for the arts. Uh, their budget uh, two years ago uh, was approximately, approximately $20 million. Uh, our goal was to increase their funding to $24 million, or $2 per person per year. Uh, basically, for the cost of a cup of coffee, the Arts Council can help ensure uh, that people from all areas of our state and from all walks of life uh, have access to the arts and can experience and participate in the arts. So our one key goal for the Arts Council was to increase their funding to $24 million. Our other key goal uh, was to increase funding for the Arts and Foreign Language Grant Program. Uh, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with this issue, uh, in 2004, the Illinois Arts Alliance conducted uh, the first statewide assessment of the arts in our schools. Uh, and while uh, over 90% of the U.S. public believes that the arts are part of a quality education, uh, our research revealed that 20% of principals uh, in, in Illinois reported having zero arts instruction. Nothing. Uh, our research uh, uncovered that it's a very uneven playing field in terms of access to the arts in our state. Uh, we know that there are large groups of young people that can go from kindergarten through high school without <coughs> ever taking a visual arts class, without ever taking a music class, without ever taking a drama class, without ever taking a dance class. If you're in this room, chances are somewhere through your childhood you've had an opportunity to experience the arts. There are lots of young people right now going to school in this state who don't have access to the arts. To his credit, uh, this governor uh, based off of our research, which was called Arts at the Core, and subsequent advocacy efforts, uh, which several folks in this room were a part of, uh, the state created a new granting program through the State Board of Education to offer schools and school districts with resources to help bolster their arts program. Uh, the first year that this, this program was created, it was funded at $2 million. The second year that, this, that the program was funded at $4 million. Last year, our goal was to increase that funding to $7 million. So our two key goals last year this time was to increase funding for the Illinois Arts Council to $24 million and to increase funding for arts education to $7 million. Uh, for those of you who follow Illinois government and politics, you know that last year uh, was a very, very difficult legislative year. Uh, we had the longest overtime session in our state's history. It was epic gridlock, nothing got done. Uh, basically, you have legislative leaders who, uh, if their goal was to stop the next person from getting what they want, they were very effective at that. 
but the history, and then I'll shut up and pass it along, the history of that, that funding. So if on August 10th, 2007, that the Illinois House and Senate did finally pass a budget. It was great for the arts, uh, over a $3 million increase for the Arts Council. It was great for arts education. That budget then went to the desk of Governor Rob Lugovich. Uh, the governor gutted arts funding, uh, historic reduction in arts funding. Uh, he also eliminated funding for his own program, for the Arts and Foreign Language Grant Program. So here we were close enough to our goals that we could smell them and touch them. Um, dollars that support artists, support theaters, museums. Uh, and next thing you know, there was a cut a very deep cut. And mind you, these weren't across the board cuts. The governor, in essence, cut uh, over $460 million out of the state budget. And he didn't do it by saying, you know what, times are tough. I really want health care. Uh, we're going to have a 2%, 3% cut across the board, all agencies. No, that's not what he did. He picked and chose agencies that were going to be cut. Um, and if you read between the lines, uh, the chairwoman of the Illinois Arts Council today happens to be a uh, woman by the name of Shirley Madigan, and she's a great leader and champion for the Arts Council. Uh, Shirley Madigan just so happens to be the wife of the Speaker of the House, Michael Madigan. Michael Madigan just so happens to be uh, oftentimes at odds with the governor. So when the governor uh, issued his veto budget, there were many uh, who felt including many reporters, that the, the cuts were politically motivated. They weren't about the merits of the arts, and mind you, the arts were just one of several uh, industries, it, uh, issue areas affected. Um, but it, it, the cuts not only cut to the bone of the arts community, they're starting to cut off the limbs of the arts community. Um, right now, today, for this fiscal year, 45 states increased their investment in their state arts agencies. 45 uh, states said, you know what, the arts are good for uh, children and families, uh, they're good for our educational growth, they're good for our economic vitality, let's <coughs> increase our investment in the arts. Three states cut arts funding. Illinois happened to be one of those states, slash uh, $4.5 million uh, in arts funding. Um, where we're at today, um, on. February 20th, last Wednesday, the governor unveiled his veto budget. Uh, it was essentially flat funding for the Illinois Arts Council. Uh, there are indications that he will restore some arts education funding, but we really have an uphill battle uh, for Arts Council funding. Um, there was a 30% cut in their grants to organizations, uh, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, we understand that there will be hearings held throughout the state. Uh, there'll be budget hearings held in your neighborhood. Uh, it's really important that you make your voice heard. What happens now in terms of the budget is the, bu the budget goes to both the House and the Senate, uh, it then goes to a conference, and then it'll go back to the governor's desk. Um, it's important that you reach out to your state senator, to your uh, state representative, and let them know that the arts are important uh, in your community. Just to give you an idea of the cut, and, and I brought quotes with me. We, we, the Illinois Arts Alliance conducted a survey. Um, we didn't want people to just take our word for it about the impact of these cuts, and they're devastating. Um, you know, we have, we've heard from individual artists who've contacted the Arts Council, and because of the decrease in funding, they want documentation so they can apply for free and reduced lunch program for their children. Uh, we've heard about organizations such as the Sun Foundation in Peoria, which is teetering on the brink of having to close their doors. Um, I can actually speak to that because I was affected uh, very directly by this. Um, for about four or five years, uh, I worked with the Fox Valley Arts Council, um, very big group of people, um, Elgin area. Um, I designed their publication, which came out quarterly. And it was one of the things that, you know, when you talk about your core being coming together with what you're doing for a living, I felt so good about this project and about this group and what they were doing uh, in the Fox Valley region. And they got their Illinois Arts funding canceled. And so the public canceled. canceled. Oh, wow. They went under. They went completely under. And um, 
um, I had completed. I got a small uh, amount of money for, I mean, relatively small amount of money for designing the publication, um, but there were only two people that got paid on this publication. One was the printer and one was me, the graphic designer. Um, they went under, they could not pay. Um, they went under owing me $2,000. Uh, I certainly would not even consider bringing them to court because I understand uh, the politics that contributed to such a terrible thing happening. And then the problem with that is that um, we put ourselves as a state or as a nation in the position of relying on the corporate world to fund the arts. And we all know as artists, or perhaps we've got wind from other artists, that one of the most difficult things about earning a living creatively is uh, having to smush yourself into this cookie cutter mold of what um, uh, people who hold the money want us to do. And um, um, so, so the publication really went down the tubes. We tried to fund it by going out getting more advertisers. The advertisers didn't want to advertise because they're not getting the results they wanted. And so this fine organization that had been um, just very successful for very many years, even be well before um, I became involved in the graphic design aspect, um, just folded. And it was nurturing and supportive to many different kinds of artists, writers, poets, um, visual artists, and dance. <coughs> And um, in terms of alliances, I think that um, this is exactly the place where we need to be talking about what can be done and what can be achieved um, when partnering up to express our concern um, in a political arena um, about what these types of policies on a state level are really doing to the deterioration, um, to deteriorate our community cultural and uh, artistic community <coughs> and um, you know it, it's very important as a as an artist uh, to think beyond the immediate because certainly artists um, uh, individually although some may indeed be affected in, in their um, practice by the Illinois Arts uh, Council budget cuts uh, because maybe they don't get the fellowships or you know the organizations that they work with, for example, um, you know, uh, suffers financially, but that their particular uh, practice may not be so directly affected. So oftentimes, because in our you know, kind of climate of political detachment, we no longer have that um, knee-jerk reaction um, when things like that do take place, we're a little bit detached it is extremely important for us to think beyond our immediate needs and goals and think in the long term. How does this uh, policy really impact something that's beyond our immediate uh, practice? And you know, this is a prime example. It could affect the designer that works for the nonprofit. Or the nonprofit, for example, the Chicago Artists Coalition, can't conduct certain programming that affects our practice, we have to potentially cut some of our programs. We haven't yet done so, but the question does come up, can we sustain the same level of programming when there are uh, budget cuts and our grants are smaller? Can we sustain the same level of programming and provide the same level of service at the same caliber to the 2,500, 2,300 members that we have and who rely on those types of services? We also have the newspaper that um, needs to be mailed on a monthly basis. Not only do the grants um, atrophy because of these cuts, but also mailing costs increase. So we have had several interesting phenomena take place in the same year. We have experienced the budget cuts, and we have experienced a tremendous amount of mailing cost increases. When those things are put together, in the same context, uh, many organizations, not only the CAC, experienced tremendous uh, deterioration in their operations. Um, and they really have to be careful how they maintain and sustain um, their programming. So when, when we try to figure out how as artists we can impact the world around us, we need to 
find those issues that in the long run will have a very significant impact on our lives. They might not affect us tomorrow, uh, but they will eventually affect us all. And you know, these types of cuts um, do. Um, other types of policies that have been um, uh, you know, uh, impacted by these discussions at the state level uh, definitely do as well. So it's not, um, how shall I say, you know, we've explored the political engagement of our members through various different um, uh, surveys and uh, through programs. And, you know, little by little we understood that there isn't quite as much a political engagement. But in these days, and especially, of course, with this political uh, campaign in full swing, um, we need to consider the uh, immediate future rather than just, uh, you know, tomorrow. So um, there might be reasons for us to um, analyze how we can partner up with big organizations like the Illinois Arts Alliance and other organizations like um, Fox, um, Fox Valley Arts Council, um, you know, wherever we are, we need to partner with organizations that represent those communities. And uh, in, as I mentioned, in larger numbers, we can really affect change. You have a lot of information. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I think one question that would be good, being that maybe five years ago, I was kind of on the opposite side of this, so that sounds great, and Alliance sounds great. I don't know, are you gonna give me a handout? How do you get connected? I think that'd be a good question for you guys to answer after we get some more questions out there. And just to remember mm -hmm. this, that no matter the kind of artist you are, and that you don't even need to be an artist, the alliance piece is do these people share the <coughs> common goal, the common interest, and that it, when I got involved with the Illinois Arts Alliance, it had a profound impact on my life I would have never guessed. I really thought I was going through emotions when I signed up with them, and what I got was the whole community that was there for a whole wide range of resources and friendships and going to Washington. I've done what you know Ra's talking about, going to Washington. I was never a politically minded individual until I realized that one person, a 20-something person, could impact um, that kind of change. Aside from you know all that you've talked about, what can these groups how do they benefit the artists individually by being part of that? Yeah, Which groups? I, 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 like your art coalition? Oh, well, we, I think, um, on the, we have slightly different missions. Um, and I can I, talk about mine. And you can <laughs> speak, and I think that he did introduce his uh, group a little bit. Um, we, as a service organization, as I mentioned, we offer professional development programs for artists. We provide a comprehensive listing of opportunities where artists can exhibit um, grants, residences, what they can take advantage of. We also host a very large art exhibition called the Chicago Art Open that features about 300 artists in Chicago, Chicagoland area. Um, we offer marketing opportunities, visibility on our website. We um, have about 400 online galleries, from, you know, 400 different artists. Um, we attract nationwide attention for those interested in purchasing locally. Um, so, uh, you know, collectors or even people interested in commissioning artwork come to our website to view artists' work locally. Um, we are a resource for artists, professional artists, and uh, we create the opportunities that artists need to succeed as uh, professionals. And I would say the focus of ours is advocacy, and we our, our charge is to make it easy for advocates to get involved in the legislative process. Um, we have a number of events and activities that we facilitate. Um, Melissa mentioned Arts Advocacy Day. Every year we lead a delegation of advocates to Capitol Hill uh, to meet with members of the Illinois Congressional Delegation. Um, that's scheduled for March 31st and April 1st. Um, we'd love to... Uh, have you accompany us if that's something you're interested in. Uh, details are on our website. Um, we also, uh, as been mentioned, try to make it very easy for you to take action. Uh, we're sending out an, an action alert, and if you sign up, we'll add your, your email to our list. Uh, on Monday, uh, we're sending a, a 
an action alert to the field to encourage people to contact state lawmakers. Um, we'll be facilitating, uh, the, the Illinois House will be facilitating budget hearings, and our charge is to make sure that at each of those hearings, people who care about the arts stand up and voice, make their voices heard. Uh, and that hearing date, which isn't public yet, but will become public on Monday, will be posted on our website. Uh, but we also focus on information, research, and capacity building. So in addition to our advocacy agenda, uh, we have a number of programs and services geared to support artists and arts organizations. We convene the largest uh, conference in the state for our arts professionals in partnership with the Illinois Arts Council. It's called the One State Together in the Arts Conference. Uh, our next conference will be held in Peoria in June of 2009, so give you a year heads up there. <laughs> um, the other piece that we focus on is leadership development. Uh, we conducted a, a survey of nonprofit arts organizations a few years ago, which found that um, most nonprofit uh, executives plan to retire. Uh, many of them are baby boomers or uh, pre-baby boomers. Uh, and what our focus has become is, is the next generation of arts leaders. That, uh, as those current leaders um, careen toward retirement, that the next generation of arts leaders are, are ready to step up and assume the leadership baton and lead these uh, cultural institutions. Um, we've published a number of publications around the whole notion of leadership, uh, transition, leadership succession, and we have two programs uh, that focus on uh, matching um, emerging arts leaders with seasoned professionals, and all that information is on our website as well. Um, I know we're running short on time, and yeah, I want to just pick up on, on something that Melissa mentioned, is that it, getting involved makes a difference. And there are a lot of people who have the belief that uh, elected officials are going to do what they want to do. My voice really doesn't matter. Uh, and, and I'm here to tell you that it does. Uh, I, I work for uh, a legislator. Um, and, and, there's a, and I know that it doesn't take a lot to stimulate a response or to get a legislator's attention. Uh, and I, one of my good friends and, and mentors, uh, who's a, uh, a member of the Illinois General Assembly, has a story called the cockroach theory. Um, you guys ever heard this theory? It's a, a theory uh, that connects to why it's important to get involved in the legislative process. And the theory goes something like this. Uh, if you get up in the morning to make a bowl of cereal and you go down to your kitchen cupboard and you open the door and you see a cockroach, uh, you'll probably be concerned, uh, but more than likely you'd kill the bug, make your bowl of cereal, and go about your day. Uh, the next day if you wake up to go make your bowl of cereal and you see two <coughs> cockroaches, but well, you're going to be more concerned, but you probably would just kill the two bugs, make your bowl of cereal, and go about your day. Uh, the third day, you come down and make breakfast, and you open your cupboard, you see three cockroaches. Well, you're probably going to do something. You may go to the hardware store and buy some spray. You may call an exterminator, but it's going to stimulate some kind of response. And it's not because you see three bugs. It's because in the back of your mind, you're thinking about all of the bugs that you don't see. And not to equate cockroaches to constituents, but it's very similar. Uh, if, if, if an elected official, Barack Obama had a line when he was a state senator, if he gets 10 pieces of mail on an issue, it's going gonna, it's gonna to prompt some kind of response from him because he knows that he's hearing from his constituents and he also knows that these constituents also represent the views of other constituents. If you got together with two or three of your friends, um, or if you know... Uh, two or three artists, or two or three of your board members, or two or three people in your class or your community, and you send a, a, a letter or make a call to a legislator, it does, it's not going to take a lot of volume to get their attention. Uh, and and it, for me, that's the, the, the main message that I want you to take away from this session, is that your voice, your view matters. And you all have a mayor. You all have a state rep. You all have a state senator. And it's their, in their best interest to hear from you. They're going to make decisions whether you're at the table or you're not at the table. Uh, and it's important that they hear from you in order to make sure that they're, they're, they're making wise decisions. Uh, in terms of outlook, what to do, uh, opportunities to partner and get engaged. Um, we have uh, an advocacy network of over uh, 9,000 individuals. Um, through that network, we provide regular updates on issues that impact the arts. And we have an online advocacy tool uh, where you receive action alerts, where, where really you can master the fine art of pajama politics. 
and that's where you can send an email to uh, your, your governor, the, the president of the Senate, uh, all from the comfort of your own home. Um, it, it, it costs nothing to get involved, and I, I urge you to sign up and give us your, your email. Okay. Just one thing, uh, me personally, I don't know my representatives. I don't know anything. I don't get involved. I don't read about it. I don't take time to do that. But my grandfather, like in the 60s, voted, and he knew every single person. And he was at meetings and did things. To me, it's, it's, it was the era, the 60s, where people were really struggling, you know, making changes. And that's, I think, what we need again. We need that 60s mentality. Well, I'll be the poster girl for that. Yeah, I, think, I think we are, actually. At, um, we are getting there, the 60s mentality, if that's um, an appropriate name. Um, it took us a while, but we're in a war. Um, and I think that just that in and of itself, even if there weren't a political election, um, should definitely wake us up a little bit. So, um, you know, beyond the Illinois Arts Council budget, which is of great concern to us all in the art community and Illinois, um, there are national issues at stake. So, um, you all need to be registered voters. Yeah, and and so in terms of even um, affecting change, um, you know, Rod did mention that it doesn't take a lot of individuals to actually motivate um, a representative to consider an issue important. However, it does need some mobilization on your part. So um, I would consider if you're college students, you know, um, voicing your concern about different policies, uh, talking to your friends, um, starting to be conscious of what it is that's happening around us, and discussing those issues with your friends, colleagues, associates, you know, family even, um, and, 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 you know, mobilizing your group to um, make their voices heard. Um, indeed, it doesn't take uh, a large group to raise the consciousness of these representatives, but you have to also be persistent because even if they hear from 10 people, they might not actually have the possibility to take a specific action at that moment, you know, because it just might not be an issue that's on the table at a certain time. So there is this kind of need to keep in touch with your representative. Um, you know, bring those issues to the table on a regular basis. Um, some representatives, depending on who they are, open their doors to the community every now and then. Um, don't they have, you know, some people, certainly aldermen in the city always have those types of opportunities to engage with their community and um, neighborhood and ward. State representatives also do that. Um, John Fritchie, I know, was a very welcoming uh, person and, and he does an opportunity to engage with the community. Um, those are the times, and also, you know, you should call and ask what those opportunities are. You know, when is the the um, representative available to discuss issues of concern to me as a as a registered voter, um, and make you know have those um, vo those um, concerns uh, heard. I just like also like to say that they make it very easy for you to contact your representative. They, they, you've got choices of what paragraph you want to use or if you want to write something completely original. Even if we're so busy, it's all written for us. All we have to do is send it. So I, I'm the poster girl for the new movement. I was not interested in politics. I've never been interested in politics. Um, I am interested now because I do see, as Ross said, that I can make a difference in this way and it is something I'm passionate about. So. Yeah. And you don't have to be interested in politics. You don't have to be a political junkie. You could care about the quality of life in your neighborhood. Uh, and the bottom line is, for issues like the Arts Council funding or Arts Education funding, it's going to have an on-the-ground impact uh, in our schools and in our neighborhoods. It's going to mean less art. Uh, and you know, we conducted a study that revealed that the biggest losers uh, of this cut uh, are children and families. Arts organizations, both large and small, have been forced to scale back in size and ambition. Uh, 
over 450 organizations responded to this, uh, this survey, uh, and, they, and of those respondents, 73% of organizations that received arts council support said that how they plan to make up for that lost funding is to reduce or eliminate outreach programs, education programs, free performances. I think also taking it out of the political context um, briefly is that we need to all become ambassadors of why the arts are so important. Uh, it's my uh, viewpoint that our country is losing its very soul. And I think that the elimination of the arts or the cutting back on the arts is a reflection of the majority of people in our country. So I think, you know, one of the things I do is I teach an art appreciation class. And I've got kids taking this class because they have to take it. And by the end of the semester, I think I've pretty much won them over to the understanding that art is not superfluous. I think there are too many people in this country that believe art is just, oh, a little icing on the cake, and you know, artists are a little wacky, and they don't really take it seriously. Um, so I think that we can all be ambassadors to this concept uh, that all else passes only art endures.